The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media. This is Time by the Tent Podcast with your host, Joey and Holly Baird. Coming up on the program today, we're going to talk about what we can add to our tents to make our camping experience more enjoyable, as well as camp cooking at the campsite and a short segment for those of you who use CPAPs and will be concerned about taking those along the way, as well as Terry from Tree Runs Wild YouTube channel will be with us. Join us. Welcome to Time by the Tent Podcast. I'm your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and camping partner, Holly Baird. This program is all about camping outdoors, hiking, land ownership, and everything in between. You want to be part of the program? You can send us an email at, garden, at TWVGshow at TWVGshow at gmail.com. That's TWVGshow at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call on our hotline, 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-7469. Uh, you can find all past programs at our parent website. That is the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com underneath the camping and camping podcast pages. We do have a... Uh, a YouTube channel, Time by the Tent, same name as the program here. Just type in in your uh, YouTube search, Time by the Tent channel, and you will find us in studio video and podcast replay. People who are listening, thank you very much. Let's get into the program, Holly, and we're going to discuss ways to make your tent more enjoyable. Right. So, yeah, so many people think about how they're camping in a tent and it sounds terrible. Well, your stories of camping in a tent <laughs> as a young person seems not so enjoyable compared to what we experience. Well, it wasn't not it's not that it wasn't enjoyable. I'm just telling you how it was. Which wasn't enjoyable. <laughs> it was fun. It's just that a lot of tents are small. Smaller. Don't then, small one to th- th- what what two to four person dome tents. Right, and they're short, so you have to you can't really stand up in them. I can stand up in most of them because I'm short. Right. But um, it's not as it's not comfortable. Yeah. And you you kind of it, it's a little cramped. And then there's situations where, you know, they get dirty because you bring your camping shoes or boots or whatever in them and blah, blah, blah. And also back in the 80s and 90s, we probably didn't have the best ground um, like a what's it called? Ground cover. Like a sleeping mat. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Or I think we had air mattresses finally at some point, but I just remember we were camping up in the UP of Michigan, and waking up and there was like I put my glasses in the pocket of the tent and I think there was like frost on my glasses, and <laughs> it was just kind of cold at times. Um, but other than that, it was it was fun, and I still. As much as I can appreciate why people go camping in campers, I can also very much appreciate a tent. Well, we do. We have a small. I think it's a. It's an Ozark Trail dome tent. I think it's four person tent. I mean, two person if you're okay with each other. Four people if you really like each other. Uh, It's an eight by eight. I've slept in it one night. Uh, We our our primary tent at this point. Uh, more tents, uh, other tent will be purchased, but right now it's a 10 by 12 Ozark wall tent, and it is a, basically a small cabin that you uh, construct where you can walk in, you can, you know, sit down, and it, it's a small building that you pop up where you're going to camp, whether it's a public, private, or, or wherever you're going. Right. I, I like it. I like it because it is a little bit more spacious. The only problem is is that at nighttime it does get cold. Well, we don't have a, a heating source in there at this time. Right. But what I'm saying is that when you sleep in those smaller tents, your body heat does warm it up. Right. But yeah. is that the equivalent of, hey, I can't stand up, but at least I'm warm? Yes. Okay. I it, don't know. Th- it's a trade-off? You're, well, the you're... last time we went camping, the, the first night, I was cold the yeah, whole Right. We I, but there's other reasons. Yeah. But I'm just saying that that's one thing that I miss about the smaller tents is... Your body heat warms it up pretty pretty efficiently, 
as is. But also it's it's the convenience factor of being able to stand and walk in and, and do all that. So some some of the ways and we're gonna kinda this this will work for both small tents as well as wall tents or larger tents. Uh, things in which we can add to our tents to make the, in, the the camping trip more enjoyable. And that's the whole point of being out there, not being miserable and being cold and can't wait until you get home, even though you were can't wait until you get camping. You want your experience to be nice that you kind of don't want to go home. Right. And it is your it's your shelter. It's where you're, you're going to sleep. And if you're not sleeping well on your trip, I know for me, it's just going to make me frustrated and crabby and then. If I'm staying more than one night, it's it just piles on. So something like a cot, a sleeping ground pad, or an air mattress, or any combination of those is helpful. With the dome tents, there are some of the tents that you – there are very small – cots in which you can backpack in. They fold up into a little sleeve and they are a couple inches off the ground or you can get a traditional like army cot where it's like 14, 16 inches off the ground. Both tents that we have, the dome tent does can uh, uh, accommodate a standard cot uh, if you choose to do that, just a, a four-person tent, uh, a three-person dome tent. A, a, an air mattress, if you are the only one using that air mattress, if it is a twin or a queen like we have, we have to reevaluate how we're going to do things in the coming camping season because every time one of us moves, the other one gets shuffled across the mattress. And then it was hanging off the one side. Right. It would slide off. Yeah. yeah. It was. We, and then we put it in, in the actual mattress frame, but still it's a very uncomfortable you, every time you move, the other person's some, moving. We need some ratchet straps to keep it on the cot. Well, we slide it in, in the sleeve. That yeah, but even the last time, right, I think it shifted. Right. But we're going to remove that and go with a firm mattress uh, or portable mattress to where if I move or you move, we don't all move together type of thing. So if you're using a air mattress. I don't want a firm mattress. Well, something that doesn't, it's not like, you know, air mattress type of material. There's, there's so it's not like bounce. a foam, like a foam. Oh, foam. Yeah. yeah. So it's not bouncing around. Correct. Yeah. Um, so that fan, uh, you, something in the summer, it gets warm, especially in the shade. Dome tents, you don't have, you know, you've got ventilation wall tents, you've got windows, you can have uh, battery-operated cir- uh, fans that will circulate the air, bring the air in, bring the air through. We have a, a ceiling ceiling fan. ceiling fan that goes in our tent that uh, runs off a 5-watt USB port uh, in our power station, and you can invert it to circulate the air up or down. It's like $18 off Amazon, and it works very well. Yeah, I really like it. Um I mean, I, we didn't really use it, but when you when we did use when it, we did to, use it, it. It felt good. What, one of these, whenever you go to our our YouTube channel, Time by the Tent, you will see. And those who are already on there, you can navigate through some of the product reviews that we do. And we chose to purchase things that maybe we wouldn't use on a every week basis, but we had it available for when we do need it. Right, and that's that's important. Is that you want to um, you want to make sure that you have something just in case sometimes, or rather have it and not use it, have but then not have it and need it. That fan is like less than half a pound. I mean, if you're backpacking up a mountain or hundreds of miles or something, that may be not something you would want to invest. But if it's if you're car camping or just hiking in to a small area and you're going to pop your tent up, it does work in the dome tent. Uh, you guys got to be careful you don't set up too quick uh, when you have it in the uh, the shorter tent. A uh, clock, as well. This is, this is your thing. Yeah, a clock. You want to know what time it is. We have a a, a a one foot diameter clock that we hang on the side of the wall tent. This, some of these are not applicable for dome tents. But that's something we bring, as well as pillows, inflatable pillows. Now, we will bring traditional bed bed pillows. I don't know what you call those, just traditional pillows. But we also have inflatable blow-up pillows. Uh, you know, I, I, there's traditional, sm- yeah, just regular bed pillows. They're inflatable pillows, that and then camping pillows is what they are. There's all sorts of type of camping pillows, right. hiking pillows, backpacking pillows, whatever. Some people just take their sweater or something right. and just roll it up and use it as a pillow. But I think I think the important thing is a lot of people who maybe have gone camping and then they get older and they think about 
sleeping uncomfortably in a tent and they're like, I'm never camping again. But at the same time, you can have these comforts. And then there's these negative Nancys who are like, it's called glamping. And it's like, it's not glamping. It's just having some comforts so that you can actually enjoy your time instead of dreading, you know, being stuck in a hot tent with no airflow and not knowing what time it is and having a crooked neck from not sleeping on a proper pillow. And then maybe you want to be off the ground. So there's nothing wrong with that. These are perfectly fine things to want. And these are all different for everybody's uh, needs or wants. And if you're camping multiple days at a, a DNR site or a state park or a hip camp, or you have your own property in which you've set up a campsite that you just visit on a semi-regular basis and everything is already there, you're just bringing in maybe you know, you're bringing in food or you're bringing electronics that, you know, the batteries or the, the uh, power station, things like that you don't feel comfortable leaving, you know, hours away at, at, on, on a property. So uh, other things in which we have found that works quite well in a dome tent and or a wall tent is a nightlight. Some just a small illumination of light to when you get up and you most people have to get up at least once in the middle of the night to to use the, the restroom. We have it where it plugs into our power station. We have an old one that plugs into the 12 volt. There are little lights that plug in through the USB port. And it's just like a, it's a, a wand arm, and it's just enough to cast a low light in the tent so you can see what's going on. So you don't have to have a bright light and essentially disrupt your what your brain waves because the light is too intense. I, I don't know what the if, – if you wake up and you turn all the lights on, it's hard to get back to sleep. But if you have a small – It like disturbs your, yeah. your cycle, your sleep cycle. It it makes your brain think that it's morning time. Right. So the lower yeah. the light to see where you're going, the better you are when when doing that. And it's worked very well. We have an um, example of that on the YouTube channel as well. Now, you have twinkly lights as something that you would suggest somebody bring in order to in enhance their camping experience. The twinkle lights are, are nice because... They give you a little ambiance, mm -hmm. and maybe maybe you like burning candles at home, but you don't want to burn candles in your tent. <laughs> and yes, yeah. you can you can get electronic candles, yes. or some you know something something that's safer like that. A small small battery operated lantern or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But twinkle lights are nice because they can give you that dim light ambiance. It can feel relaxing. If you have kids, that would be a if you have calming. Kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but just for yourself, maybe you're like, this is my peaceful time in nature and the sun has set and i just want to sit in the tent and enjoy myself for a little bit that's what twinkle lights are, are good for or you just think they're pretty whatever and so there's anything most of them are battery operated you can get rechargeable i assume yeah rechargeable but like my friend just gave me ones that i think are mushrooms or fairies or something uh -huh. so there's like ones that are different shapes um and, so and there's always rechargeable double and triple a batteries so you're not consistently right. re buying more of those okay and, yeah. yeah so anyway um you can find ones that are just plain there's all sorts of different ones there's L led ones mm -hmm. um so yeah you have you have options for tr some people call it track lighting too you can get that option as well right and if that is enough illumination to where you don't have to have a night light then that can run all night and kind of do serve dual purpose i mean i'm not going to have it run all night but some people might yeah yeah so those are just some of the things in which i mean we can you can add a table you can add some chairs if you're in a, in a wall tent in a um in a, a dome tent the um things in which you can add becomes a lot more limited because of the space you have available uh a, an eight by eight uh, by four and a half foot is much much different than a ten by twelve by uh, seven foot. So I will say this: if this is maybe you're considering camping or your first time camping or whatever, if you're not backpacking and don't have to worry about space or weight, I would go with I would err on the side of larger. Mm -hmm. So if the like, tent says four people and you're just two people, get a six or an eight. Get a six. <laughs> yeah, or an eight. yeah, maybe not an eight, but maybe a six, because right. um, then you have room for your your bags and things like that. And you have to think about that stuff about not just yourself and where you're sleeping, but also some of the stuff you bring. 
Right. So with that being said, what what do you uh, suggest that you would advise people to take on their camping trip? You can send us an email at twvgshow at gmail.com. When we come back, we're going to talk about cooking at the campsite. You're tuned in to the Time by the Tent podcast. Goodbye, biting bugs and plant invaders. No More Bugs by Natural Green Products is your answer. A product pioneered by the USDA and 14 years in business, No More Bugs has been the favorite by consumers across the country. More than a repellent, it is safe for you, your pets, your plants, and your home. Visit nomorebugs.net for free shipping on orders over $50. Use coupon code free ship. For me, that's free ship, the number for me. Grip Stakes produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have a high-quality and durable products to last a lifetime. They're built beyond tough. Their wool socks come from the Rocky Mountains, and even for the most sensitive toes, these socks are made for everyone. High-quality wool socks make a huge difference for happy feet. You can wear them around the house daily, to the outdoors, to the garden, etc. And we are glad that we made the switch ourselves because they are incomparable to any other sock we have worn. Designed and manufactured in-house for the best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American-made manufacturing. Check out their belts, wallets, and socks at Grip6.com and coupon code RADIO15 to save 15% off your order at Grip6.com. If you're in the upper Midwest, head over to Fleet Farm where you can find everything you need from tires to tree stands, drills to dog food and toys and tools. They've got it all. You can save even more at Fleet Farm when you join their Fleet Rewards Loyalty Program. You get exact... You get exclusive offers, and it's free to sign up. Get everything you need at one low fleet price. Shop in-store or online at Fleet Farm at fleetfarm.com. Wind River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes is always inspiring harmony. With a large selection and customization options, you'll find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to find out more. Welcome back to Time by the Tent Podcast. I am Joy Baird. Beside me is... Holly Baird. This program is to help you enjoy more of the outdoors, camping, outdoor activities, hiking, land management, and everything in between. What we're going to talk about, Holly, is food cooking at the campsite, which is probably one of the look, most looked forward to activities for many people who venture outside is that outdoor um, eating time, that supper, that lunch, that whatever it is. Right. And actually, you know, it's funny is I, I uh, started seeing a new hairdresser. And she's also outdoorsy. And we were talking, and she was like, Oh, you like camping? I said, Yeah, I like camping. She's like, What do you like to do when you're camping? And I was like, I don't know, hang out outside and then also eat. And she laughed and she's like, It is really a big part of camping, isn't it? And I said, Yeah. And then we were talking about our favorite camping foods. So, yes, cooking while camping is a, is a thing. And also, it's kind of, I think it's kind of fun to plan the meals and then make, you know, getting it all together and then certain depending on how you cook things it might take a little bit of time right it's not that enjoyable if you're camping for two days and you don't eat because camping and eating yeah it's, it's eating. Like just like eating sandwiches yeah, yeah yeah oh we pack 17 ham and bologna sandwiches <laughs> with mustard i can eat ham and bologna sandwiches anytime tuna and peanut butter tuna with ketchup goober <laughs> on the andy griffith show okay <laughs> so cooking so, at the camp Right. So there's a open couple fire. Ways. Yeah, there's open a couple fire. Ways to cook at camp. Yeah. Open fire. This is our favorite way. Yes. Yeah. And and you see these people on the YouTube, uh they they have to wait for the bed of coals to, you know, you big a big fire and you got to wait for it to cool down enough to cook on. I kind of just make it happen before the coals and have to wait an hour. I work around that so we can eat before it gets dark in most instances. And it's a lot easier. Yeah, it's going to get dark. But if you can get a lot of stuff prepared before it gets dark, 
works out a lot better. And you can, you know, there's certain woods that you shouldn't burn and, and cook over, and there's ones that are better. We've never had a problem with anything that we, whether it's elm or oak or pine, uh, we've never had a problem with any of the flavors infusing into the food that makes it taste bad. Right. Yeah. It's, um, I, I don't think I've ever had any, we've had any con- conflict conflicting flavors like that so open fire that's that's a good way to cook and there's also camp stoves so like propane camp stoves um there's all sorts of backpacker stoves um there's the the regular like fold open two burner situation there's stove oven things so there's a lot of options when it comes to stoves. And when you cook over fire, or over wood, uh, we'll get to the stove, uh, return to that in a moment, you want to make sure the wood is dry because there are woods to avoid uh, such as, you know, pine or redwood or fern or spruce or cypress or cedar. The, these contain high levels of sap and, to, uh, and that, that can result in a funny taste. So we want to be aware of that. Um, but if you make sure it's pretty dry, I think you're going to be okay. Now, somebody can correct me, uh, but popular um, uh, cedar planks are, are a very popular uh, thing to cook, you know, with your cooking salmon. That's a big one. Um, but keep that in mind that there's you just don't want to throw anything on the, th- on the fire. Now, some people choose not to use a campfire for cooking, but they use that propane or that double burner stove the campfire is the center focus of the campsite but they choose to cook off of the fire and and do it in a more of a controlled situation because the campfire it's hard to control the, right, the heat right especially if you are making something like hot water for coffee or tea it can be difficult to get get it done over the fire in a, a time efficient manner right um but growing up, we would we would cook some things on the stove and then some things over the campfire. So it was both. And one thing I forgot to that we should talk about is the um, the grate, the cooking grate. If you go to a state park uh, DNR site, they will have a fire pit, and from everyone that I have seen, there is some form of a cooking grate. Those grates. Sometimes are good, sometimes are not, and those whom I see cook on those grates typically lose, use aluminum foil. So the point of getting that flame-kissed steak or burger or filling the chicken, you, you get, it takes away whenever you have to put aluminum foil down as a level of protection. So what we use is a portable cooking grate that we take with us, and it's it's on a on a, on a steak and it swivels off the fire to prepare and on the fire to cook and we know exactly what we've cooked on it and it's ready to go every time and we can clean it off with a wire brush and we can get that very specific taste of that flame kiss that 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 you can't get any other way yeah joey made me um quote unquote eat my words because um i was like no these campsites have a great <laughs> and and I, he's like, is it okay? And I was like, yeah, they're fine. And I was like, we well, you use, use tinfoil, right? And Joey obviously didn't want that. He wanted the, the flame-kissed meals. And they are very delicious. And I think that, that we got that one at Cabela's, I think, what, for $60 or something? I think like it was less than that. Yeah. But yeah. So, and you can, you know, if you really wanted to construct one yourself, you could. But if you want to pick one up and just to ease and knowing it's there. Because we went to a couple of campsites where there wasn't a cooking grate. And that would have been challenging because the fire pit was there, but other things were damaged or missing. So when you go and cook at a campsite, whether you're using a open fire or a camp stove, there are certain ingredients in which you should always have on hand when you cook. Right. So sometimes you, you want to make sure you're, every time you want to make sure you have the basics. Maybe if you prefer certain condiments or utensils. utensils. And then also something like butter or oil. Uh-huh. Um, Joey and I went camping this past fall. It was our last camping trip for the year. And we got there and we realized we didn't have any butter or oil. Luckily, I had an avocado, two, I think two avocados mm-hmm. that I just happened to toss in my backpack as I was locking up, walking out the door. 
and we they did sort of worked. It sort of worked. There was some sort of component there of a, of a fat, um, not butter or oil fat, but they did work. Um, we made some interesting toast with them, uh-huh. but I guess the biggest thing is just trying to remember those items so that you don't have to hopefully have an avocado. If you are a regular camper or you are a new camper or you're going to frequently camp, however you want to do this, you should have a very small but very important checklist. Do I have this, 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 you know, five or ten things that you know that you're going to need every time? It, plates, some type of oil or butter, um, you know, utensils. Something to flip the, the, the something to use, you know, like utensils to flip the meat, uh, something like that. Now, when it comes to cooking these items, whether you're vegetarian or a carnivore, uh, you can. There's many different avenues of cookware in which you can get the very light stuff that you know you can hold in the air and it'll fly away because it's just light, you know feather light. You know these people that are ultra light backpacking people. Oh yeah. These very, very light uh, pieces of cookware or cast iron, which is the opposite realm of light. However, there is a unique aspect of cooking with cast iron that you cannot achieve by using any other type of uh, m- means that, that cast iron. Obviously, you can, you can use that on your uh, camp stove. We cook directly over the fire on things like meat and chicken and burgers. But if you're doing saute of vegetables, you can't really do that. You got to have some type of pan. And we find that, you know, a couple of tablespoons of butter and over the fire on the cooking grate or next to the fire. There's just something about that in which you cannot achieve with any type of other cookware, as well as cast iron has been around for many generations and will be around for many other generations more generations, there is Teflon types of cooking pans that have a nonstick coating. But if you are an individual that feels that that is a level of toxicity or danger in which you do not want to consume, a seasoned cast iron skillet is a great way to do it. And as you cook more and more, that cast iron skillet becomes more seasoned to the point if you do it correctly, it becomes a nonstick pan in of its own. Absolutely. And another thing that a lot of people don't think about when cooking and camping is the proper utensils, especially for cooking over the campfire, because you might need something that's a little bit longer handled. Right. You, don't, you don't want plastic. Plastic or wood. You want yeah. really metal. Yeah. And you want, when we got our cast iron set, we got it from Cabela's. It was a five piece set. What was it? It was two frying pans. And a Dutch oven and one of the lid and, – and it was five pieces there. And it came with long elbow length, basically welding gloves that are fairly heat resistant, enough to where you can get the pan off and set it down somewhere. It's not something you're going to hold on to. Their heat is – it does transfer into the glove. They're like suede or something. Right. But yeah. it's it's a very good thing. You can just go to your, your hardware store or if you're in – Upper Midwest, you can go to Fleet Farm, and you can get welding gloves, leather gloves, or, or what they call gloves in which welders use to hold hot metal, and they don't burn themselves. And this is a great thing and used to use over the campfire. You can also catch birds of prey with them. Oh, yeah, you can do yeah, that. Yeah. And if you need to adjust the wood on the fire and you don't have a poking stick or a claw hand, uh, the claw that you would normally adjust, you can use that to get in there and adjust the, 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 the way the wood lays if you need to adjust it that way without burning yourself too. So whenever you're cooking, and there, there's no wrong thing that you can cook at a campfire or a campsite. Now, if you're in an area where there are predators such as panthers or cougars or wolves or bears, your mileage may vary on how and where you should prepare the food and cook it in accordance to where you're going to sleep at night. Every animal is slightly different, so we're not going to give you the advice on that. You have to do what is safe for your particular area. But most times it is not recommended to cook inside the tent when the time of year those animals are most active or not hibernating. Right. Yeah. You want to you want to consider that because if you cook inside the tent and then you go to sleep, they might find you. Right. Yeah. And if you are in those areas, 
some type of whatever is legal for you to obtain, whether it's bear spray or a, a sidearm or some type of defense mechanism, whatever you feel is safe and legal for you to have in an area of that based on the type of uh, animal that may intrude on your campsite, public, private, uh, you want to be aware of that and be more prepared and not scared. Absolutely. So with that being said, we're going to transition over a special segment here about camping with a CPAP. All right, Holly, I'm going to let you take this because you have and do camp with a CPAP. Right. So I've been using a CPAP to CPAP therapy to sleep for I don't know. I think like seven years now. Or For something. people who are not, they've heard the name and they think it's just kind of some kind of air compressor that blows air in your face. What? For, let's get us all everyone on the same page. What is a CPAP? What is the purpose of it? Sure. So I have um, obstructive sleep apnea, and so a CPAP is a way to help me so that I don't stop breathing at night. I did have a sleep study done. And they did find that I was having a lot of episodes, not always completely stop breathing, but very, very shallow, short breathing. And then I would stop breathing and it, it happened fast. Um, I remember I was fine and then all of a sudden I was really sleepy. And then that's when I decided to to have a sleep study done. So I use the CPAP and I know there's other people who don't like the CPAP or have other treatment for their sleep apnea. This is what works for me. Um, your mileage may vary. Your mileage may vary. Um, and I, I did have to, um, I know people will have to find the right mask. I got lucky and I found one that I liked, um, right away. So that's cool. But, um, yeah, so CPAP camping is pretty, pretty basic. I think it's very popular too. It's very popular because a lot of, I think a lot of people just have sleep apnea and, you still want to enjoy the outdoors. Now, I will admit, you do have to have, um, it, it is a, a, I guess, an investment slash luxury item mm-hmm. to have, we have a battery, what is a it? Power called? station, power trackery station. power station, in which we, you can plug it directly into the, the, the outlet for power. However, we, and there is options in which you can get a conversion package and you plug it in the, the 12-volt outlet and it uses a fraction of the power in a night's sleep that it would if you just plugged it directly into the 120 outlet. Yeah, so I got an AC-DC converter. Right. DC-AC? AC-DC. Uh, AC-DC <laughs> um, converter. and Which, which was like $85. Yeah, it was like $85. And that was worth it too because it doesn't it doesn't drain the power pack as, as fast. And what I also do is I turn the humidity down on my... Uh, my um, CPAP, some people don't use their humidifier thing, water reservoir. I, I usually do. But when you're out in the woods anyway, you, you usually have enough humidity in the air to that you don't need that. Um, so I turn that down and then, yeah, just use the CPAP as is. I don't seem to have any issue. When we were camping late this last fall, I did have some what's called rain out. And that's when you get moisture in your CPAP hose and then it comes into your mask. It's like a condensation internally. Yeah. yeah. So then if you turn your humidifier off completely, it should help that. And then I also um, wrapped the hose in Joey's pajama pants because I didn't have anything. But, but there, there is a sleeve in which is yeah. designed to prevent that from happening, correct? Right. There's a sleeve. You can get a heated hose as well, and I don't, but I don't know what how much it would drain the jackery if I got a heated hose. Right. So I'd have to figure that out. I just, you know, you, like I said, I, I made a makeshift hose cover. I have a regular and one And it now. worked? Yeah, it did work. Um, you can also sleep, if you are concerned about rain out, you can sleep slightly elevated because that should help a little bit. But it when we went camping during the summer, I think it was just because it was fall and the mm-hmm. dew point and blah, blah, blah. So... So, yeah, it's possible to sleep. Now, there are smaller battery packs that you can purchase. You don't have to necessarily purchase a large um, power station, but you would have to do a little bit more research on but, that. Yourself. And there are different sizes. or what are they called? Travel CPAP machines that people will use like on airplanes. They're, they're very small, so you don't have to use. You take the, the same one that you sleep regularly with 
and go camping with it and we just adjust the settings and, and the way the power is consumed versus purchasing a whole nother unit specifically for travel purposes. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I've I've thought about investing into a travel CPAP. It's something that is kind of on my long-ish term wish list for items for camping. Which would probably consume travel. less power than the larger unit that you currently use. Yeah. Okay. Not that I not that I travel a ton, but packing it up, mm-hmm. I'm packing it, blah blah blah. It's not like it's super time consuming, but it would be nice if I had something that was portable and easier because it is about the size of if you put like two laptop bags together the, the it's case. about six inches thick yeah. yeah yeah so is there anything else that people need to know if they are they use a CPAP and are concerned about hey I want to camp but I don't know if I can I think that if you have specific questions you should definitely reach out to us I know that there are um there are small like I said there are smaller battery pack situations i just don't know much about right. those specifically if you know anybody who does um backpacking or something they might have a better suggestion but i don't know yeah. how possible it is to sleep with a cpap and backpack but yeah um tr- and there are the travel options and sometimes you might you know if i don't know i'm gonna i'm gonna try to find out if i can figure out if it's covered by insurance i'll probably would have to go visit you know a specialist first to mm-hmm get the prescription you're already paying the insurance you might as well try to get out out of (laughs) it what you can get out of it right um but if not then it's something that i definitely want to invest in at some point right so there you go if you've camped uh if you're if you use cpap and you want to camp you can certainly do that hang out with us when we come back terry from trey trey run wild will be with us youtuber you're tuned in to time by the tent podcast Farm and garden in the ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves made to protect you against the elements while farming. Farmer's sleeves offer unparalleled protection of far- arms and skin for any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker. Say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. Their sleeves offer cooling comfort and protection against elements and outdoors. An alternative to thick clothing, Farmer's Defense is made of wicky material with UBF, Protection factor of 50 plus to protect you from allergens and scratches. You can find all their great products at visit farmersdefense.com. Do you own property and you're trying to keep newly planted and established trees healthy and hydrated wherever they may be planted? Well, tree diaper technology can significantly increase the water to your trees. No pipes, no hoses needed. Hydrates from water from rain or when you water the trees eliminate watering altogether and let it take care of itself find all of the information out at treediaper.com that's treediaper.com and use coupon code garden 15 to save 15 percent off your order at treediaper.com hydrate those trees no matter where they're at on your property we are brought to you today by sponsor walton's inc listen we know you care about where your food comes from canning and preserving your fruits and vegetables what about the meat maybe you hunted or trapped that meat at walton's you can get all the equipment seasoning supplies to make sausage jerky or any other product your way to your high standards you want to make snack sticks that make that people will actually like walton's created meatjusticks.com an informational site to help you make the best finished product they have spices meat grinders mixers sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible walton's everything but the meat oh you can use Code GROW50 to save 10% off orders of $50 or more. Take those spices to the campsite with you. Waltonsinc.com. Welcome back to the Time by the Tent podcast. Thank you for being with us and downloading the program today. I'm Joy Barrett. I'm Holly Barrett. And we are going to go to the hotline to bring in our guest this week. He is a YouTuber out of Minnesota. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for the week. Terry is the creator of YouTube channel Trey Runs Wild. He shows his off-grid tiny cabin located in the wilds of northern Minnesota. He shows activities, projects that promote self-sufficiency, and a weekend homesteading theme. Welcome to the program, Terry. Well, thank you for having me. It's good to hear from you guys again. Well, we are happy that you've taken time out to talk with us. And uh, we'll start with this. For people who may be looking to purchase land, what are two things to avoid and two things to absolutely do? 
Well, let's start in order with the things to avoid. And going back to my kind of my life history story, I have always wanted land of my own. Ever since I was a kid, I had this dream about being self-sufficient, and going out in the woods, and living off the land and, you know, making a garden and, and being self-reliant. And, you know, life comes along and I either never had the time or I never had the money. And then you become a father and a husband and your priorities change. So later in life, my son and I, we were looking for hunting property and it just dawned on me that the only way we're ever going to find a place to deer hunt is if we somehow get land ourselves. And so I went back onto the journey of, of trying to find that piece of property that I always wanted and living out a little bit of that dream that I had because for once in my life, I had both the time and the resources to be able to do it. But one of the things that has held me back and held me back over the years was I don't have any construction skills and I don't know what I'm doing. But the one thing that I learned was that my fear of failure was preventing me from making the step years before I finally did. And in this day and age, there's so many resources out there, be it YouTube or just online internet searches or, or communities of like-minded people that are willing to put their journeys on Facebook or, or other social media outlets. So the biggest thing that I think is the thing to avoid is don't do it because you're afraid to make the step. If you're afraid that that it's going to be a financial thing and maybe you'll change your mind later. My belief is that land is generally always a wise investment if you get decent quality land, especially in times of per se economic downturn. They always talk about getting hard assets. If, if the dollar is weak, you know, invest in something that's going to retain its value and not be so dependent. And land is one of those things where everybody wants some and they're not making any more of it. It's, it's really not going to go down in price generally. So the biggest number one thing I think to avoid when you, when you start thinking about doing these things or getting a piece of property is don't let your fear of the unknown stop you. There's just too many resources out there to guide you on your way. And if you change your mind later, you can always sell it probably for a profit. So that would be probably my biggest thing. You know, second of all, when I bought my property, I did a lot of internet searching. And my property is, you know, a few hours away from, from where my regular house is. And it wasn't easy just to drive up there and take a look at all these different properties. So I really was dependent on the, the real estate listing and the photos that, that went along with it. And when I purchased my property, there were other people that were looking at it at the time. And this was in February. So I was a little bit under the gun as far as making a decision. And when I bought my property, the only time that I had walked it was in the winter. And I was able to find out, like, where low areas were just because I was able to look at, like, county GIS wetland maps and things like that where I had uh, geological documents that showed what the, the topography was and the, and the resources and stuff on the land. But the one thing that I wasn't aware of is, the way that water would pool when frost is in the ground. And I ended up having some seasonably wet or some intermittent wet areas that I never expected to be wet because they were high ground. But because of the way the frost or the bedrock was in the ground, I would have never expected to have low areas or wet areas in the spring uh, that I ended up having. So my biggest thing is make sure that you get out there and you look at this in as many different opportunities as you can to see as the seasons change. And I understand that, you know, a lot of times you're under the gun and these listings that are good, they go fast and you need to make a decision. But the other things to consider is, you know, how are the bugs in the summertime? You know, if you buy it in the fall, how are the bugs in the summer? Is it absolutely unbearable with mosquitoes and black flies and gnats and different things like that? Is that going to be something that doesn't affect the value of the land, but it may affect uh, your enjoyment of the land. Um, and, and so my my second thing would just be to try to get some time walking the land and do a little bit of research uh, with neighbors or in the area, look at, you know, different resources that would give you an idea of like um, 
is there bridges that have been built in certain areas or have they brought in gravel in certain areas to make, you know, different roads? Because those things could be indicators too, or culverts, things like that, that maybe there's going to be some intermittent water there either during a rainy season or during spring breakup. So that, those would probably be the two things that I would avoid is A, letting fear stop you and, and B, uh, buying a piece of property sight unseen just based on, you know, internet photos or what the realtor is telling you. So, but you know, when we, when I start talking about things that you have to do, I'll just kind of touch on something that was a, a, came as a little bit of a shock to me and, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, but, um, it's really important to check with the County where your property is located. If it's located within a, a municipal boundary, then check with the city. And then of course your state may have separate boundaries as well. And then there could even be like, um, federal land that your your land may encom- be encompassed by. My particular piece of private property is surrounded by a half private land and then half federal national forest. And so there are certain things that I can and can't do uh, based upon the, the jurisdictional governments that surround my area, which I kind of expected there to be some sort of, of zoning, but my area, it, it's so rural that it's unincorporated and there isn't even a township. So generally within a county, you have individual townships, which are run by a county or a township board. And they take care of like, you know, the gravel roads and snow plowing and things like that. But my area is so rural and because it's partly federal, I don't have a township. So generally some of the zoning things that would apply to some people did not apply to me. But I did find out that the county had some rules that required some permits and some regulations that I wasn't aware of at the time. Uh, recently, I went in to get a permit to build a sauna and a bathhouse, and I was de- denied my permit because um, they would have required some sort of gray water retention or septic or something like that, where my intent was to merely run it out. You know, you take a shower and you let the gray water run out into the onto the ground, which apparently you're not allowed to do. So the big thing is is check your areas, your counties and townships and your state for zoning laws. And they would generally be under like your building permits or, or county zoning. That's where you would typically look. The second thing that's pretty important, if, the, if you do decide to build some sort of structure that's more than just temporary and at some point you want to have a, a reliable water source there, uh, right now my cabin is a dry cabin, which means I have no access to water on the property. But some people may find that a well is extremely important to them. And that would be one of the things that I would also recommend that, that you really must do if, if a well is important is check with like your county extension agent or even maybe like your, um, your local well drillers or if there's none in the area, even like call up a neighbor if you can find them on like a plat map. Because one thing I found, and I do plan to put in a sandpoint shallow well this summer, but the way my bedrock lies it may be fairly difficult to, to be able to get to water, even though I have a lot of like surface water. And depending on your area, you may not have water, you know, it may not, you may not be able to put a shallow sand point in. You may have to have a, an actual pump well, which would require electricity. And you may have to go down two, three, four or 500 feet to get good water. So if the well is important and, and you're willing to, if you want more than hauling water in, um, check about the resources of water availability in your area because geologically it could be a lot different than what you expect. And, and you know, that could be a, a, a real bummer later if you found out that you couldn't punch a well and get fresh water. So Right. And, and your zoning uh, permits, even though you may, if people who are listening may not be on YouTube or broadcasting what they're doing, there are still people that have the legal access to come on your property to see if you're doing things legally. Yes, and I think that kind of maybe depends on which state you're Correct. in and in which county. But typically, you know, you, the county in which you pay taxes generally has some sort of right to place an assessed value on your property and how they do that accurately is by viewing you know the structures or or your property and each state could be different about how far they can come into the curtilage you know some states may say they have to come from the road other states may say they can walk around the perimeter of the property 
Uh, so each one would be different. But yes, that's absolutely uh, true. Y- you know, the other thing that that I would do, um, and Joey, you and I and Holly have talked about this a little bit before. One of the pieces of property that I considered buying, um, there was an easement or access to my to that forty acres through the edge of somebody else's property, and um, the property was a pretty good price. And and I was going to go out and look at it, and then I found out that the adjacent property owner had had this. Stay, armed standoff with law enforcement because he had threatened the previous landowner for using that access avenue adjacent to his land, even though lawfully the adjacent or the landowner had access to it. The adjacent landowner was so difficult to deal with that there's just no way I would have ever purchased that property after he had brought a gun and threatened to kill the guy who was accessing you know, his own property. So one of the other things that I would do is uh, check with your local law enforcement, even do a data privacy request for public data. So if you have like the address of your piece of land or your piece of property, you can typically go into like your local sheriff and say, hey, I'd like to do a public data request on this address. Can you provide me any information of police response to this area? Um, and that that may help you with like, hey, did they investigate a meth lab on this place 10 years ago? And maybe I need to worry about some chemicals or garbage left behind. Or maybe, you know, the neighbors next door are really difficult to deal with and there's been a lot of law enforcement interaction. Those are kind of some quiet under the radar things that you can find yourself getting involved in when you buy a property if you haven't done like your due diligence on finding out who your neighbors are so that's the other thing that i would definitely recommend is is do a little bit of searching about who's living around the property that you're looking at buying and are they decent people or do you need to be you know second guessing uh that you'd want to be their neighbor so you have so you got an amish built shed so it's just a shed, a pretty basic shed that you were converting into a cabin. Why did you go with that versus something like a wall tent, like a canvas wall tent where you maybe built like a platform or something? Sure. Well, when I first bought my property, I was originally just camping in my van. And in my van, I kind of rigged up to be kind of a, a camping place. And um, I had always wanted to build a cabin. And for a couple reasons. One was just for the the longer term structure of it. And second of all, to um, just have something that was tighter structurally, like mice and rodents can be a real problem. And I wanted to be able to have like a couch or a mattress available and not have to worry about them being destroyed every time I came up because the rodents got into them. And I had had, um, I had had a canvas teepee way back when I was younger that I used for just camping on my my yard property. And uh, what I found over years was like the birds would sit on the poles and they would defecate on the canvas and the acid and the feces after 10 years kind of ate away at some of the canvas. And there's some things you can do different to prevent that. But I just wanted something that was structurally more permanent. And because I have no skills, of course, (laughs) uh, building an actual cabin, I had looked into plans and whatnot, and I was willing to take that on. But I would drive to my property by this Amish uh, sawmill every time on my way, and one day they had a a shed out there, and uh, and it was it kind of looked like a cabin, even though it's just a shed. It it was a little bit more than like a you know a Home Depot shed. And I stopped in and I talked to the guy, and never thinking that they would deliver one way out to my place. Cause this was probably another 175 miles from where, where I bought the shed. And I talked to the guy and he's like, yep, we can build you this shed that you want for $3,600, like 3650 to be exact. And we'll deliver it to you for 850 bucks. And I thought, my gosh, I cannot buy the lumber to build a, a small cabin for that. And plus, instead of it taking me two years to build the cabin, you know, because I come up there on the weekends, it can just be delivered and I can have an immediate shelter right off the bat. And, and so, not counting the frustration. Absolutely. Yeah. And and if you've watched my YouTube videos, you know, I do a lot of things wrong because it's a learning process. And um, just, you know, the waste of materials and the extra expense and, and really having to research every move, it was it just made sense financially and logistically for my purposes. 
Absolutely, yeah. If it can be done and done right and saves you a whole lot of headache, it, it, sometimes it's okay to pay a little bit more money on the front end to, to make it happen quicker. As we get older, we don't have that time of, oh, I'll, I'll make it happen in 10 years. 10 years is not 10 years as it was 20 years ago. And sometimes right. <laughs> sometimes something like bugs and pests and et cetera, people don't always think about. They might yeah. th- mm-hmm. they think, you know, they live in a home that is fine. There's probably not a lot of bugs. But when you're exposing yourself to the great outdoors, it's not something you always think about. Absolutely. And, and the nice thing about saving the money by having them do the work for me is I was able to take that money then that I saved and use it towards finishing the inside so it was more of a cabin than actually just a shed. Or at least it feels that way, you know. Oh, it looks beautiful on the inside uh, oh, compared to what it was. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and you've probably doubled or tripled the value of that easily by completing it. Now, you'll, I'm, I'm going to guess you'll never sell it, but knowing what you've got in there, it's well worth the enjoyment. Right. Yes, for sure. And it, it does feel when you have something that's comfortable – you want to spend more time there, right. you know, and, and it's fun to think about being so r- rustic. But for me personally, like if I'm going to have guests or my kids or, you know, my spouse come up, they want a little bit more creature comforts than, than, uh, you know, living under a bush lean to, you know, right. So, right. Well, yeah. you, you live in, in the, the cabin or the property is in Northern Minnesota. And for people who know about outdoors, uh, animals, that's black bear country. Do you see a lot of black bears? Do you have to encounter them? How do you deal with that type of animal uh, on your property? Sure, yeah. I definitely have a, a high density of black bears in my area. In fact, I talked to the local DNR biologist, and one of the gravel roads that I that is across the tar road from my access, they actually call the bear highway because there's such a high density of bears on that particular road. And I have had them um, on my game camera in camp. And I have seen them on my property in person, but I've never seen one in person in my camp. So I think when I'm on the property between me making noise and the dog, I think they just stay away. You know, there's thousands of acres of wildland around my property. So there's plenty of room for them to roam. Uh, The other thing that they did was the private land that sits adjacent to the back half of my property they came in and selectively logged that about five years ago, and most of it was mature forest otherwise, but that really created a lot of new growth, which when you open up old forest, you get a lot more berries, you get a lot more sucky, you know, tender green grasses and things like that. And the bears have plenty of, or much more variable and plentiful food sources, so they don't have as much need to come into my camp to look for bird seed or things like that. The only thing I'm concerned about is my barbecue grill. You know, if I'm out grilling hamburgers and you get the grease in the grill and then I leave for a couple days, I use, you know, I'm really surprised that I've not come back yet and had my grill just torn to pieces because, you know, they can smell the the grease in it. But but so far, so good. I got my fingers crossed. It, it may be one of them things that they know there's habitat there, like humans. And apparently, from what I understand, they're kind of like coyotes or other wildlife. They're more scared of you and what you're doing or your property than you are of them. Yes. And, and black bears, I'm really not afraid of, the, of them. You know, I've come across them in the woods, you know, a fair number of times. The only time I would really be concerned is in the, in the spring when they have cubs. Yeah. Definitely do not want to get between a mother and her cubs, but they're so unlike grizzlies. Like grizzlies, I've done some hiking out west, and they absolutely terrify me. I Just a completely night and day difference between the different types of bears. All right, great. So um, you speak about your wife and your kids, and I know – in some of your videos, you go hunting with your son, Hunter, and then mm-hmm. we've seen some videos of your, your wife visiting the And your daughter, the proper, hunt, your, hunt, yeah, too. Oh, and your daughter, too. Um, do now They don't show up on the videos a lot. I'm assuming they enjoy the land, but do they just not want to be on YouTube? I know sometimes when people have a spouse or a parent, they think about the impact of the Internet and they don't want to show up on the videos, or is it just something they're just not used to? Sure. No, well, so... The reality is they, they don't really come up very often. Like, this is my thing. This is this is for me. And, and part of it was, you know, making that place where my son and I could have this hunting place and, and I could put in gardens and fruit trees and, and you know, do my thing there. 
Um, yes, my spouse does come up a couple times a year. Um, it's not a place that she doesn't have the same feelings towards it that I do. And she is more happy um, being in the house, you know, in um, closer to town and, and doing her things there. My daughter, and so her and my daughter want nothing to do with YouTube. Okay. They're like, don't don't film us. We don't want to be in the public eye. We don't want to be part of your dorky videos, you know. And um, But my son, on the other hand, he's gotten used to it over the years, and he just doesn't care. So he's he's pretty okay with it. Um, so the few times that, that they do come up, because both my kids are in college now, they're out of the house. And and uh, so the times when, when they're all up, I'm just respectful about their their wishes and their privacy so well my grandparents are 85 and before they had a cell phone they were on the internet and they didn't know it so if <laughs> pe- pe- yeah. if you're if you're alive you're on the internet whether you want to be or not in some form or right. fashion that's how scary the system well, is and a lot of yes. those a lot of things if you have a landline or if you ever had a landline yeah that you can still look that up and you can find somebody's address and it's not oh, yeah. it's not hard to find a lot of information quickly unfortunately but yeah it makes sense i know a lot of people just don't want their face essentially yeah. On, yeah. on some place yeah so yeah. Uh, uh, of the things that you've done on your property over the last four years what is something dangerous you have done that you probably shouldn't have and you learned a lesson about it and you're not going to take that risk again well you know one of the things about living out or not living but one of the things about spending time out in rural areas is for me personally, the the closest hospital is 30 miles away. And so I try to be fairly conscious, conscious about uh, safety and risk versus reward. But sometimes there are things that you just have to do because they just need to be done and there's no way around it. So I really don't do a lot of dangerous things. But one of the things that I do do that probably could get me hurt is felling trees Mm -hmm. and i've had some some widow makers on the property where the top has has broken off and it's still hanging there and i've had some trees that i thought were more solid and i start cutting sawing into them and they're completely hollow through the middle and you know i'm waiting for 80 feet above me to come crashing down at me at any point so really i think probably the only thing that i could really consider dangerous is is the felling of some trees on my property. And I know there's one that in particular that made me very nervous. And what I did was I actually called my daughter before I started cutting the tree. And I just said, Hey, I'm cutting this tree. It's a little bit sketchy. If I don't call you back in 20 minutes, call the local sheriff right. and have them do a welfare check on me. And, um, as it turns out, you know, the tree went, went fine but you do have to think about like even small things, you know, if I'm using my ax and I split my foot open or, you know, if I do, you know, have an accident with the chainsaw, help is a long way from, from my place. And if I'm not able to drive into town myself, that means I have to wait a half hour for an ambulance to get to me and then a half hour for them to get me to the hospital. So you do have to be cognizant about like even first aid things like, you know, having, you know, things like fire extinguishers and, and first aid kits and making sure your cell phone's with you if, if you can get cell service. Um, so you do need, in fact, it's funny because one of my viewers had actually commented to me and he's like, you know, here's a tip for you. Uh, you always, a lot of times you put the nose of your car uh, facing in toward your driveway and the back end facing out towards your access. And he says, why don't when you get there, you turn your vehicle around. So if you ever need to make a hasty exit, the last thing you need to worry about is backing up quickly, right. you know, or backing off the road into the mud or something like that. So just little things are probably things that, that you need to think about that you'd never think about in, in town or if you were, you know, three miles out of town. And and you had, you had an incident with a chainsaw. Now, was that on the property or was that... <laughs> no, that actually wasn't even on my property. Okay. <laughs> that uh, a friend from work had a big tree that dropped in his yard, and part of the tree dropped on his neighbor's cars. So, of course, I do a fair amount of sawing up at the land, and I'm like, yeah, absolutely, I'll come over and help you buck this tree up and, and get it off the neighbor's car. And the very first cut with the chainsaw, what I failed to realize was that limb resting on the car was under so much tension. And this was a very large old maple tree. And um, there was just so much tension on that limb that when I started cutting through it and it lost the integrity, it just exploded. And that limb came back and actually 
hit me in the face and, and split my, my chin open fairly decent. I ended up having a bunch of stitches and, and, uh, I, to be honest, I'm surprised I didn't lose some teeth, but luckily it hit me at just the right angle where, where if it would have hit me more from the side, I probably would have lost some teeth, no doubt. But, but yeah, you know, sawing is definitely not something to, uh, to take lightly for sure. You always got to be on your toes. Right. And, and you use, uh, the, you use quality equipment too. It's not just El Cheapo you bought on sale. You, you use steel and that's what we would get when we have land. That's what my family has used on the farm. I think it's the best there is. And if you're going to do stuff like that, you need to have quality equipment, uh, so you can rely on it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I love steel. I have a couple different, I have two different saws, a smaller one and then a larger one. And they, you know, they start every mm-hmm. single time, even if I don't use them for over the winter for two months, you know, they've just been super reliable. And, and of course I don't wear them all the time, but you should have a good set of chaps and some steel toed boots. And of course, hearing protection and eye protection. Absolutely. And, and really, and I don't have this, but a lot of people will even wear, you know, a, a logger's helmet because a lot of times when you start putting vibration on that tree, if it's dead, there can be some dead limbs way up ahead that'll break loose. And if they fall down on your head when you're focusing on the saw bar, you know, you're not going to get knocked out and, and hopefully, you know, traumatic brain injury because right. you didn't have protection. So. And, and people say steel is expensive. You get what you pay for when you buy a sealed chainsaw, and that's quality. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe that 100%. And I, I've had some cheaper saws in the past, and they tend to be disposable saws mm-hmm. after about three years. So, Well, we really have enjoyed having you on the program. How can people find out more about you and your great YouTube channel? Yeah, so I'm not on a lot of social media. I do have a small Instagram account, but I, I really don't use that very often. My main platform is YouTube, and my channel is Trey Runs Wild, which is T-R-E, which is merely my initials, which is uh, my first name, middle name, and last name, first initials. And um, so if you look for Trey Runs Wild, you'll be able to find my channel and come along for the for the fun. Well, Terry, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered and the uh, insight and education that you've shared with people who may not be aware of things because they just don't know about it. And we thank you for that. Well, you're very welcome. And I'm excited to follow you guys along on your journey. And I'm Looking forward to uh, your new channel coming up as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, we're sure happy that Terry took time out of his day to join us on the program. A lot of good information he provided for us. Yeah, definitely. Especially for people like are looking for land to purchase. Very good information. And if possibly in bear country. Right. So thank you for tuning into the program. Thank you for downloading the show. And tune in next week time for the program for more hiking, camping, land management, and everything in between. For Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the woods.